Okay, so far we have defined the rate of a chemical reaction as the change in concentration divided by the change in time. And we have seen how the rate of a reaction changes over time. It starts out really fast when the concentration is high and it slows down. So we do not have a constant rate, but we can calculate what's called the instantaneous rate, and we've done that already. Um, so we have what's called a rate law, and so let's pretend we have a reaction A plus B equals AB. Well, an example of a rate law that we might have might be something like this. We have rate equals K times the concentration of A to some x power times the concentration of B to some x power. We have seen how the rate depends on what the concentration is, so it shouldn't surprise us to see that in our rate law we have the concentration of things in them, and as the concentration is different, the rate will be different. So for example, let's say we have this reaction here with the NO2 and the ozone. Um, the rate law for that reaction is actually written as rate equals K. Now the little k is what is known as the rate constant. And we've seen lots of k values and constants before, so this is really no different. Uh, the rate's constant is specific for this particular reaction at this particular temperature. So we can, uh, the K value is always the same, but it's only good for this reaction. Every reaction has a different K value. And then we can see it depends on the concentration of our reactants. What is the concentration of NO2 and the concentration of ozone? Depending on what those are, we will get a certain rate. Here's another example of a rate law. Um, Actually, before we get to the other example, if we look at this rate law, let's look at this question over here. So if I have a reaction going and it has a certain rate right now, what would happen to the rate if I doubled my concentration of NO2? Okay, hopefully you got that one correct. You can see that there is a directly proportional relationship here. If we make our NO2 value twice as high of what it should, then my rate is going to double. If, if I take this times 2, this is going to end up being times 2. How about if I triple or cut it in half? Okay, so we can see that's what's called a directly proportional relationship, where whatever we do to the NO2 concentration, the same thing will happen to a rate. Directly proportional relationship exists between the two. So here's another example of a reaction. And the rate law for this reaction is this. And in this case, we can see that it's the concentration of NO squared times the concentration of oxygen. Again, there's a K rate constant for that specific one. So in this case, what would happen if I double my concentration of NO? All right, so this is a different ball game here because in this case it is NO squared. So if I double my NO, since that is being squared, it actually has an impact of increasing the rate by four times. Okay, what if I tripled it? All right, so hopefully you got that right. If I tripled it, well, we're, we're tripling what's inside of there, but since this is squared, it's going to have the impact of the square of 3, which is 9. So in that case, my rate would increase by 9 times of what it originally was. So here we have a case where it is proportional to the square because we have this exponent here. Here, there's no exponent written up above. That means your exponent is 1. So whenever your exponent is 1, it's directly proportional. If it's 2, that means it's proportional to the square. Okay, so what about if it's cut in half? All right, again, because the square of 1 half is actually 1 fourth, so the rate will be 1 fourth of what it was there. Okay, now how do we come up with these rate laws? Where does it come from? Well, it actually comes from experimental data. So what we actually have to do is a bunch of different trials of reactions and measure what the rates are. We have to measure how the concentration changes over time. So up here we have our rate law that we just wrote and talked about for that one. And let's see if uh, this experimental data that we have over here, is, is this consistent? Does this support this rate law? So what we want to do, um, when, when you're looking at this graph, each of these means we're basically just doing the experiment again. So uh, for trial number one, we did an experiment starting with these concentrations of oxygen and our nitrous oxides. And then we did another experiment, but we started with different concentrations. 
and so forth. You see our five trials that we have there. So if we look, we want to see, well, okay, what is, uh, what's different about trial one and trial two? What did we do? And hopefully you can see um, the NO is the same, but we have doubled the concentration of our oxygen. Now, what we're interested in is, okay, when I doubled my concentration of oxygen, what did that do to the rate? Well, we look over here and say, oh, well, that doubled the rate. So that actually tells me what kind of a relationship there is between the oxygen concentration and the rate of the reaction. And we can see I doubled one. That means the other doubled. That means it is directly proportional. So that means in my rate law, I'll have a K value, but the concentration of my oxygen is proportional, which means the exponent is one. And normally we don't have to write those. Um, we don't write the ones, but um, we have that. Okay, so that's the difference between those trials. We already answered all those questions. All right, so let's compare trial one to trial three. Now, in this case, we've eliminated the variable of the oxygen because the oxygen is the same. So you can see what we did different is that we doubled the NO concentration. Okay, my oxygen is the same in those two trials. So let's look to see, well, what effect did it have on the rate? Well, I wrote these in non-proper scientific notation for you so that it was easier to see. And we can see that our rate increased by four times, which means that this is not directly proportional. I doubled this, that increased by four times. So that tells us it is proportional to the square. So that means in our rate law that we have, we have our K, you're going to have your O2. We said that was directly proportional, but the NO that is in our rate law, we can see from the data here that it's proportional to the square. And so that's how we come up with these rate laws. We have to experimentally do things and, hey, let's change this and see what it does to the rate. And so we're looking to see, is it directly proportional? Is it proportional to the square? It's usually going to be one of those two things. It would be pretty rare that it would be proportional to anything else. Okay. And if we just to verify what we've done, if we look at trial one and trial five, okay, and let's look, well, what, what's different between those two trials? Well, the O2 is the same, but if you look, we can see that we tripled our concentration of NO, and now we want to look to see, well, what did that do to the rate? Well, 3 and 28, that is an increase of 9 times. So we can see, yes, it's still consistent. It's proportional to the square. I increased this 3 times. Uh, 3 squared is 9. That means my rate was affected 9 times. So that verifies our rate law that the 2 is actually the exponent for the NO. All right, so that's how we can determine those. So take a minute and go ahead and determine what is the rate law for this reaction. Okay, so we're trying to do this one and hopefully you got this right. Now, if you didn't get this right, the key is to figure out which trials to look at. I like to try to find trials where only one of the variables are changing. So trial one and two are good trials to compare here. Let me get my point. Okay, so uh, trial one and two are good trials to compare here because the only thing different is we have doubled the concentration of NO. And we want to take a look. Well, what did that do to the rate? When I doubled NO, what did my rate do? Ah, it doubled. That means it is directly proportional. So when I write my equation here, the rate is equal to K. Uh, NO is involved and it's directly proportional. That means the uh, exponent is one, which I don't have to write. So let's compare some other ones where uh, we're not changing much. Okay, so actually, if we look at trial one and trial four, you can see the only thing different between trial one and trial four is we doubled the O2. So let's see, what did that have to do with the rate? Oh, that didn't change the rate at all. It's the same. That means, O2 is actually not in the rate law at all, okay? Or if you want to think about it this way, it's there, but its exponent is zero. 
you can write it in that way if you want to, or you can just totally leave O2 out altogether. So it does not depend on the concentration of O2 as far as what the rate of the reaction is. So now we have to figure out what the exponent for NO2 is. So we need to find some good trials to compare. Well, I now know that I don't need to worry at all about this column because changing that doesn't change anything. So if we go and look at trial two and trial three, I'm focusing on, well, what did we do to the NO2? And uh, you can see we left the NO the same, but I tripled the NO2. And then we come over here, well, what did that do to the rate? Well, it increased it by nine times. It's a little harder to see there, but 4.2 times. Um, no, actually it only tripled, sorry, my bad. Okay, it is a little hard to see there. Okay, so I tripled one, we just tripled the other. So that is directly proportional. So that means my exponent is to the one. So that would be my rate law for that one. Okay, here's another example to look at. Go ahead and take a minute and answer this question. See if you can figure out what this is. And one more for you. See if you can figure out what this one value is. In this case, what we're also doing, besides determining what the rate law is, it wants to know, this question at the bottom here, is what is the rate constant? And the rate constant, that's our k. So once you've determined what the rate law is, we can come up with this. So we have the rate law written up here, and the k that it's asking us to find is the k that's in here. So we can actually rearrange our rate law to solve it for k, so k is going to be equal to the rate, sorry for the messy space here, divided by my concentration of H2 times the concentration of NO squared that we have here. And so all I need to do is pick any one of these trials. I know what the rate is. That's this column here. I know what my concentration of each of these are. And so I can actually solve and get a value for K. So if you ever ask for the rate constant, if you can come up with the rate law this way, you can just plug one of the trials in and get your answer. Now, interestingly enough, it does not matter which trial you use, you will get the same answer either way uh, to come up with your value for K. So a couple terms when you're doing uh, writing these rate law expressions, okay? Um, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about the order of the reaction, and don't let that confuse you. That's nothing really complicated. The order is simply what power of 10 uh, the sum of your, it's basically what power your exponents are to. In other words, it's the sum of all your exponents. And you're only concerned about the exponents that are on your species that are in the reaction. So in this example here, there's no exponent written. It's a one, so this is a first order reaction. In this case, this guy is a one, this guy is a one, so one plus one equals two. Can you handle this advanced math? So that is a second order reaction. Now here's a more classic example of a second order reaction where we have something like this that is squared. Okay, so that's all that terminology means. If you hear that, don't let that confuse you. What would be the order of this reaction? Okay, so that would be a third order since my uh, exponents all add up to three. So third order reactions, you're not going to see those too much. Almost all the time reactions are either first order or second order. There's a few cases where they're zero order and even rarer, you might have a third order reaction. Of course, a zero order reaction means that that n the species that's involved there does not affect the rate of the reaction. So it's not in the rate law at all. So therefore, there's, there, there's nothing else here. It's just rate equals K. You can see the concentration. The rate doesn't change the whole time. Steady rate, no matter what the concentration is. So it is possible to have zero order reactions. Whereas with first order reactions, we've seen how um, the rate as the concentration gets higher and higher, the rate gets faster and faster. Okay, usually it's done the reverse as far as time goes, but we've seen first order reactions that way. So the rate law is something that you have to use this experimental data. You can't just look at an equation and say, oh, this is the rate law for this reaction. 
I mean, if you did, you might look at something like this and say, well, all right, well, you can predict what you think the rate law might be, but you might not be right. You might look at it and say, all right, well, let's just take this and this. Those are my two reactants. We'll pop it in and there's the rate law. But in reality, we would be wrong because the rate law actually is this. And we'll find out why a little